flooding is most often associated with rivers leaving their banks, but flooding can also occur in places other than along rivers. In this video, we will discuss common types of flooding and their relationships to floodplain management and the National Flood Insurance Program, or NFIP. These key terms and acronyms will be used during this presentation. You can find the terms and their definitions at the web address on screen. The most common type of flooding experienced by most communities is riverine flooding, also known as overbank flooding. Riverine flooding occurs when a river channel receives more rain or snowmelt from the watershed than it has capacity to hold. The excess water tops the banks of the channel and spreads across the floodplain. Generally, the larger the river and its watershed, the deeper the flood and the longer it will last. However, the destruction from riverine flooding may come not only from the depth and duration of the water, but also the velocity of the flow. In hilly areas with faster moving water, a few inches of floodwaters can damage structures or, worse yet, sweep away pedestrians and automobiles. The NFIP defines shallow flooding as flooding with an average depth of one to three feet in areas where a clearly defined channel does not exist. The most common shallow flooding situations are ponding, sheet flow, and urban drainage systems. Where there are no well-defined channels, floodwaters may spread out over a large area at a somewhat uniform depth in what is called sheet flow. Sheet flows typically occur on relatively flat land after an intense or prolonged rainfall when soils are already at or near saturation. During sheet flow, the floodwaters move downhill and cover a wide area. In some flat areas, runoff collects in depressions and cannot drain out, creating a ponding effect. Ponding floodwaters do not move or flow away. Floodwaters will remain in the temporary ponds until they infiltrate into the soil, evaporate, or are pumped out. Ponding is common in areas where man-made features have blocked natural surface runoff outlets. An example is in the areas protected by levees along the large rivers. Being in floodplains, these areas are flat and don't drain naturally, especially when a levee blocks the flow to the river. To drain these areas, channels have been built and pumps installed to mechanically move the water past the levee. Often, these man-made systems do not have the capacity to handle heavy rains or intense storms. An urban drainage system is a network that incorporates natural channels, man-made ditches, storm sewers, retention and detention ponds, and other facilities constructed to store runoff or carry it to a receiving stream or lake. When most of the man-made systems were built, they were typically designed to handle the amount of water expected during a storm that had a 10% chance of occurring annually, often referred to as a 10-year storm. Larger storms overload them, and the resulting overloaded storm sewers and ditches produce shallow flooding in streets, yards, parking lots, and low-lying areas. Flash flooding is caused by extreme rainfall occurring over a short period of time. Flash floods often occur in smaller watersheds and in rivers with steep slopes and narrow stream valleys where water velocities are high and warning times are short. It may also occur or be more severe in urban areas where impervious surfaces such as roofs, streets, and parking lots convert nearly all rainfall from a severe storm into surface runoff. Understanding and awareness of flash flooding is critically important because flash flooding causes the most flood-related deaths annually in the United States. Several of the videos in this series address how flood studies are conducted and how flood-prone areas are mapped for use in regulating lands and insuring properties under the NFIP. For now, it is important simply to understand that detailed flood studies are conducted differently for riverine flooding than for shallow flooding. 
the result is that a flood insurance rate map, or FIRM, probably does not show all flood-prone areas in a community. While riverine flood studies involve analysis of a watershed's characteristics and the ability of the channel of a stream and its adjacent overbank areas to convey the water resulting from a rainfall event, shallow flooding areas are often mapped based simply on past flood events and examination of the topography. It is also important to know that FEMA generally does not map shallow flooding areas where water depths are less than one foot. Today, you have learned about the most common types of flooding and the relationship of these types of flooding to the NFIP.